people are trying to do more family, do more personal, do more with work and everything. So the busyness is, is kind of getting out of hand. And I think that a lot of people will think AI is going to make that better. I don't think that's the case. I think that's it's going to help people do their job and be more efficient and and take some things off of some people's plates, but it's going to add other things to that plate as well, too. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Epiphany Off The Cuff. My name is Rick Meekins. I'm going to be your host today. And we're joined in the studio by Jeff Suarez. Jeff, how are you, sir? Doing good, Rick. Thanks for having me on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I am looking forward to talking to you. I think our folks are really going to get a lot out of this show today. We're going to be talking about technology and business operations and you know, something everybody's dealing with. You know, we've got the AI just jumping into the mix now. It's just going to, you know, we don't know what direction to go. So we're, ho we're hoping you can give us some great insights on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been interesting. I've, I've spent my whole career in advertising and on the service side of things and we're ourselves dipping our toe into the technology side of things. So it's a new adventure for us as a, as a provider of that, as opposed to being a, a user as well, too. So it's a it's a fun topic. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Folks, don't forget, uh, you want to make sure you subscribe, hit the bell, make sure you get notified every time we drop a new episode. So, sir, let's get into it. So, Jeff, um, why don't you tell, your, tell our audience a little bit about you, what you do, what, uh, tell us a little bit about my mouth isn't working today. <laughs> Tell us okay. a little bit about what you do and your, and your work and your business. Uh, just give us a little bit of a that that two minute pitch, if you will. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been in advertising my entire career, so I got about twenty years under my belt, um, and I've owned for the last nine years and founded um, Ethic Advertising Agency, which is a fifteen person shop that focuses on hyper targeted digital advertising and then the creative services that that support it as well too. So, um, why, that kind of, why the name ethic? What, uh, what, that's, is, what is it? What's the name? Yeah, ethic is one of the best marketing uh, decisions I made for my company. Also, one of the worst SEO ones as well, too. As <laughs> I like to say, but um, yeah, I there's a couple of reasons for it. I actually wrote a blog because I get asked that question so much that that answers sure. it. But some of them are I didn't want to name it after me because I wanted it to be bigger than me and outgrow me. Um, and everything, because what even if I die, retire, whatever it is, and, and everything, the the thought is is have something that can it can outlast me. Uh, the other thing is is um, you know in the advertising realm, there are historically you know uh, unethical decisions that will pop up and everything, and you're faced with those decisions from time to time, and whether you make the choice or not is kind of you know a little bit of a crossroads. But the reality of it is, is that it's an industry that is traditionally grinding people down. We're overworking them under, uh, get, you know, giving them not enough resources to do a good job that causes corner cutting that is can kind of be considered unethical kind of thing. So I, when I was naming this, I was like, I want something that's going to going to keep that culture kind of in place and have that be a reminder and a little bit of a guidance for it. So when uh, when ethic popped into my head, it just it just seem to to fit a lot of my boxes i love that i love that i love that and i apologize i cut you off but uh thank you so much for that <laughs> no it's one of my favorite um questions to ask and everything because every time i get it it validates that it was a good decision to to name it at that so um the uh the other thing you know we've been around for nine years this september uh and everything anything from the you know, the one person working out of the corner of my duplex kind of thing, and now up to the 15 kind of people and, and everything. So we've scaled that up nicely. And we've been having a lot of really good growth and success with it, which has been fun. And I, I also took it from me trying to be all things, all people to that, that niche of hyper targeted digital and creative services, which is, um, yeah. has been a, a really nice catapult for us. The next venture that we've kind of been getting into for the last about month and a half, we've, we've had it launched is um, with our hyper-targeted kind of focus, we are very proficient in programmatic, including a sector called geofence advertising. Uh, but one of the things we realize is not everybody has access to it, um, the, the best technology, and is able to do it themselves unless they have a certain minimum spend. So we created the first platform that allows anybody, small business, what you know, whoever it might be, to utilize geofence advertising and the controls in their hands, and they can run... Um, uh, highly targeted lo location-based advertising, which is going to be like, if I am a restaurant and I want to target people that are at a, another restaurant near me, 
with ads for the next 30 days, I can do a geofence and use GP tech, GPS technology to identify that their device has been there as well as any connected devices to that. And then we serve, um, can serve either display ads, um, OTT CTV, which is like Hulu, Roku, Sling TV, those kind of things. And then video pre-roll ads as well too uh, for the next 30 days as, as well. So that's our new kind of venture into being a tech provider and creator and everything, uh, which is really cool because I've always played with other people's toys and now I get to play with my own. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you guys, guys came up with the idea because just because that uh, niche existed or that hole existed or. Yeah, I, I actually had the idea for about four years and just assumed somebody else was going to do it uh, yeah. and everything. And 15 people is it. We're still a boutique agency. We're not a huge company by by any means and, and everything. Yeah. And even smaller four years ago, even smaller a year ago kind of thing. <laughs> so I, I felt like there was a hole in the market for that. And it became more and more prevalent um, because we do the back end providing of services for geofencing to geofencing.com, geoconquesting. We've had hundreds of conversations with um, people that are interested in it. But our closing ratio on that as an agency, maybe two, 3% out of all those conversations. And the reason is, is because as an agency, we have minimums. We don't accept credit cards. Uh, traditionally, we um, do provide a live reporting dashboard, which not everybody does. Uh, uh, but we are also a managed service. We're doing it for you and stuff. So as I was looking at this, I kept on realizing there was like six closed doors of geofencing that every provider kind of had, which is it's managed service and people want self-serve sometimes. Uh, sure. People want you to take credit card. They want a live reporting dashboard. Um, they want to be on the best technology and they want to have competitive um, rates or cost per thousands and everything because because it's a manual process uh, before we automated it. Uh, and everything, a lot of places had to do 300% profit markups to justify the people that are actually pulling the levers and running it and have those overhead and those costs. So sure. keeping the uh, the rate uh, competitive uh, was a big one. And then, of course, the minimums as well, too. Like people can use um, QJAM is what we call the uh, uh, the software um, and spend a dollar a day if they want to. They, there's no minimums. Nice, nice, nice. Awesome. You know, that, that's always a conversation that there are that that pops up you know your your company you're you're a business you know you've been doing what you do um and you can only customize off the shelf stuff you know to a certain uh to a certain level you know to a certain degree it's just not doing you know one of those one of the things that you need to do whether it's an integration or you know whatever it is how did you get to the point where you were like okay you know what um i'm just going to go ahead and, and and pull the trigger or how does any business owner you know, really come to come to that decision process. So, like I said, it's been launched for a little over a month and a half, but we've obviously been working on it for over a year. Um, so I got to a point where my mentality and my opportunity kind of met. I've had this idea for a while. I thought that the market was ready for something like this, and my mentality has always been because uh, you know because I'm. 38 years old, like I have a long stretch and everything. So there's a big component of, of my entrepreneurial mentality of invest in myself, invest in my companies and, and forward, you move forward that way and everything. So uh, as the ethic advertising agency kind of has grown, it's allowed me to have capital to, you know, invest in different areas. And this is something that I was thinking of. And we just kept on having conversation after conversation of we're not the right people for you. And we're happy to refer to somebody else that is the right person. It's not like we were like, ah, oh, we can't help you go, you know, go pound salt. We just yeah. didn't have for a lot of these individuals the right resource for them and everything. So I was like, if we just naturally take those calls that we're having and convert them and put a little bit of ad and marketing behind it as well, too, I feel yeah. like it makes sense to uh, take on that risk because I feel, I feel like the reward is there. And mm -hmm. as a tech piece, it, you know, my analysis is, is that has the potential to get, you know, grow a lot faster and a lot more unique and have even more excitement than an ad agency. Like we're really good as an agency as, as well too. Uh, and that's been growing steadily and, and everything, but there's a component of it's intellectual property. It's our processes. It's our people. It's a lot of things that go into it that doesn't necessarily make it completely unique. Like there's a lot of agencies out there, right? 
there is mm-hmm. really you know only a handful of people that actually provide geofencing as a software and as a service and everything um and even mm-hmm. a smaller uh sector uh that are going after kind of like maybe smaller medium-sized businesses or small marketing departments and then yeah. there's really like nothing of its kind that's doing exactly what this is so the the risk reward analysis just got to a point where i said this is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to create and to push and everything like that. And if I lose it, okay. But if I don't do it, I will regret it forever. So okay. that's kind of what the crossroads I was at. And I jumped in and it's the same way that I launched ethic as well too. Cause ethic I wanted to do since I was uh, in college, I had an internship when I was 20 that at an ad agency and I realized this is what I want to do. So then I yeah. spent about 10 years working towards uh, the skill set and building capital, flipping houses, as well as working for like CBS television and other ad agency and everything. And then uh, finally getting you know faced with it and saying, I've been working towards it. I can either take that leap or just do the comfortable corporate thing. I took the leap and it worked out. So I also got a little taste of the success of that as well, too, that made it a little more comfortable for me to say, you know. What's the worst thing that could happen? I lose a bunch of money. I have time to make it up. It's not a big deal. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. But the beauty is, is it's I'm, working. People are using it. So it's uh, oh, it's got a nice trajectory already. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. How, how much planning, um, you know, really went into that from, you know, I mean, obviously you've got the the app, the plan of the app, but uh, in terms of um, understanding, you know, what kind of ROI you wanted to get or, you know, projecting, um, you know, how long that would take, you know, for break even and, and all of that. Yeah. Did, did you go that far or did you kind of? Yeah, because I, it was brand new for me. Like when I launched Ethic, I, I got debt free and I needed to make a little bit of money to sustain my lifestyle. I think at the time it was yeah. like, it was 2014. I needed to make like $17,500 to maintain the lifestyle I had. I wasn't married, didn't have my kids uh, and everything. I had a duplex that one half was paying for the other and stuff. So I worked really hard for that very different situation in it here where I was like, I have opportunities to leverage debt. I can bring on partners if I wanted to. I ended up self-funding this and, and everything to get off the ground because I wanted more control and I felt like I could do it as well too yeah. uh, and everything. So there was the capital side of things that I had to figure out. There was the business planning side of things that I had to put together as well too. Um, I'm a big fan of the book Traction by Gina Wickman, uh, which is the EOS system. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, so mm-hmm. I like taking elements from that as well, too, for the strategic side of things. Uh, and mm-hmm. then I was also really lucky. I have, um, a, a good mentor and a guy named Jeff Nicholson, who's the CEO of Tracer, which is a Gary Vaynerchuk company who I ran this by. And he ended up being like anything tech based. I run it by this guy, Jeremy Leventon. And he is a MIT PhD, like has worked at, at Twitter and has done a lot of things. So um, I, I brought him on uh, to be a consultant and some of his vi- advice has been absolutely phenomenal as well, too. So I, a lot of the planning, a lot of the prep work to just figure out how do we piece this together to launch it to its, the best of its ability, because I'm not trying to raise a bunch of capital or anything like that. I'm trying to build something that's a profit engine as well, too. Yep. So that means that what I do in the forefront is really going to affect how fast we can get to that. And, uh, and really affect the longevity of it as well, too. So the whole process to figure out what I want to do with funding, find um, the people that I want as well, too, because I hired somebody part time, uh, a brilliant guy, Patrick, um, uh, who spent seven years in the Navy uh, doing um, PR. And, uh, mm-hmm. and now he's finishing up one, one year at uh, Texas. Uh, and everything to help me with some publications and getting out there and outreach and, and everything. He's a big reason why I'm even on the show and everything. So I got mm-hmm. surrounded with a little bit of an ecosystem of people to help me with this as well, too. And then I have a business plan that has three outcomes by the end of this year. The outcome that nobody wants where it doesn't work, the outcome that's kind of hitting our benchmark and the outcome that's exceeding our benchmark. And then we have kind of a trajectory as to where to go after that. Love that. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, well, let's let's talk about, uh, you know, technology in, in the broader perspective, you know, looking yeah. at, um, you know, how companies or how your company perhaps uh, evolved. You know, it's like, you know, you start a company and you're in one place and then it's like, OK, I need another piece of you know tech. You know, what, what, what was your evolution like? So, I mean, it went from 
you know, 2014, I was coming from the TV side of things. Uh, I mean, I quickly identified that digital was was the way that I wanted to go. But it was I was like a media buying service, right? I was always buying from somebody else and everything. And and I had this moment where if we're going to do the digital, one of the best things we can do to provide better services, take a little bit more of a margin for us because we'll incur harder costs and, and larger costs, but be able to control the quality and the timeliness and the efficiency of it of bringing that in house. So by doing that, we've kind of slowly but surely rolled in new technology into our our day to day. So we went from like just emails and spreadsheets to as we grow our team, we grow our technology. Um, we adopted uh, NinjaCat for uh, our live reporting dashboard. We brought on uh, a software called Advantage, which is um, uh, does media buying and media planning, project management, accounting, and time tracking for us, and it's built for ad agencies. Uh, we also um, utilize multiple demand side platforms for our programmatic and and just kind of keep evolving some of the technology that we utilize. And then on our list for this year, it's been a lot of like, how can AI help you in your department, whether you're creative or writing content or keyword lists or whatever it might be and everything. So kind of tapping into what becomes available to us as well too, and constantly evolving it. So there's like a natural progression that I find as long as you're open to it and what works for us is open to it, but also creating sprints around it too. Being able to say there's too much information for us to look at all at once and everything. So let's kind of have this basket of ideas that once we get through our checklist, our checklist is maybe five things that's all mm-hmm. pulled from this giant basket of ideas. Once we're done with that checklist, go back to the basket, rummage through it, pick the next five things that you want to do, and then maybe do a sprint on like this technology that we want to want to look at and, and maybe upgrade or add or something like that. Or mm-hmm. an operation side of things, or a process side of things, um, uh, the, you know, those kind of things, and that allows you to kind of chip away at that basket. What most people do is they figure they have like a list of fifty things, and then they just never get to it all. So I try to, I picture it, and I try to get my team to picture it as that more of that junk drawer basket kind of thing of ideas. But then you can pull from yeah. it, but you have to keep a very, very short list of no more than five things to actually focus on. I love that. I love that. So when when you're talking about like the the drawer, or the five things, is this like um, like different software that you want to uh, want to integrate, or is this different things, tool sets that you that the company wants to integrate into what they're currently doing, or what what does that look like? Yeah. So the basket's like every good idea that you have that you would love to get to right now, but you can't, right? So it covers all of that plus more and everything. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that with this methodology that I like to do is we utilize um, uh, kind of like annual planning thing of like, what do we want to accomplish this year? But then we each as individuals have what we call quarterly rocks, which is taken from that EOS traction system where everybody has this this goal to, to like a rock to pick up go across a a goal line and then drop it. It's like a measurable thing saying like, Hey, I accomplished this. I did 10 of these, whatever it might be. So we have different things that allows us to chip away at that basket and stuff, but it might be a technology thing that's in there that we need to look at. And we've known that we need to look at it, but we need to give it enough time and dedication in a chunk versus just always being like, I need to get to it. I'm going to research one thing. And then you don't have time to go back to it and everything. And you forget what you even researched and everything. You have to say, hey, I'm going to get it done in this quarter or in this six months or in this month and everything. And this is going to be be my review sprint. And we're going to figure out from this, uh, are we going to stick with our technology? Are we going to change our technology? Are we going to add it or whatever it might might be for that particular sprint of um, of reviewing to improve our company? Love it. Love it. Okay, cool, cool. I I, I love the accountability and the, you know, the the very clear, um, I guess, cadence. Um, that you guys have put together. That's, that's fantastic. So what is, what is your process for uh, selecting a software? Do you guys, um, you know, find a software and say, oh, this would be cool for my business? Or do you say, okay, this is an initiative. Uh, this is, you know, one of the ideas that I have. Let's go find a software for it. Or is it a, a combination of the two or something um, else altogether? Kind of a combination of the two, but it's definitely more identifying that we think that something could be better and then trying to find the solution, then it is something pops up and we're like, oh, we should look at adopting this. Because again, if you think about it, like we're ignoring, not ignoring, but we're, we're, I guess in a way, ignoring all of the sales pitches, all of those AI emails, all of the LinkedIn kind of things and stuff like that. If it's interesting, 
it goes into that, that basket. It goes into like, hey, we should probably look into this. Not right now. Don't look into this right now and everything because we're not in a sprint to review this kind of technology or this kind of information and everything. And then once we are, you know, so it might spark an idea for us to look at when we have time to do it uh, and everything. But a lot of times we can kind of analyze of what are, is our pain point and what is our need? And then um, from collecting that information over time, it helps us kind of do a short list of who we maybe want to start with. But then we also deep dive into like asking for referrals. We, you know, go to the internet. We kind of try to figure out what other agencies are doing as well too, to, um, uh, to help out as well too. So it's a lot more of the problem causes us to find the solution, then the solution presents us uh, itself. And we realize, oh, this could solve our, our problem and everything. But yeah. not to say that that never happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so do you, when, uh, so do you find yourself doing, so when you've got that initiative and you're like, okay, I need to find a software, do you guys go through and uh, just like create like a requirements document or something like that and just start uh, your process that way, or um, you guys have vendors in mind typically, or is it you know just complete blank slate? Um, uh, you know, let's see what's out there. Um, yeah, so it's uh, normally the way that that we kind of go about it is we identify first who needs to be involved in it on our team side of things. So yeah. There's there's a, trying to not have too many hands on cookie jar because that can jumble it, but having the right people that are involved that can actually assess it. Right. So yeah. identifying the individuals that are going to be working on it. And then from them, usually we're asking them to work on it because they have some kind of association with that technology of how they're going to leverage it. So then they yeah. kind of create their wish lists and then we can compile compile that to figure out, well, this is what we want it to accomplish and everything so that way when we go and do a demo or we do something we can say this is how we use this is what we do now this is what we want to do so then when we talk to the technology companies they can kind of customize how they they interact with us to showcase more specifically of how we would kind of use it so that's kind mm -hmm. of our methodology of of how we we do that and then we we you know try to um have as large but manageable of a list of of providers as possible validate if we can validate them before we even talk to them like talk to somebody who's used them and, or everything or we'll look at the reviews and if they have bad reviews we probably won't won't go with them and, and everything um and yeah. then try to just kind of slowly but surely narrow that down and then really vet them this is this should not be a hey let's just try to you know switch it over right away this should be a, a longer process to figure out is this really going to work because i'm i'm kind of done just jumping from like hey we're this size we need something that'll just work right now I'm much more yeah. focused on we need something that we can do at a 15 person agency and at a 25 person and a 30 person agency. Nice. Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. So it's like a, a strategic approach. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So one, one of the things, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming that we all see, you know, is, is our vendors are constantly, you know, they're constantly developing They're you know, obviously they need to stay competitive and keep, uh, keep us on their platforms ideally. How do you guys manage? You know, it's like, you know, AI, um, you know, we were introduced to AI. And so, you know, a number of the platforms that we're using are saying, hey, we've got AI this, AI that. Um, do you guys, how do you guys look at, you know, perhaps adopting uh, like some of those, some of those changes that the, um, you know, that your vendors are providing? You guys have, is that like stuff that goes in the drawer again or is that, you know, something else? Yeah, I mean, stuff that we're actively on is a little bit more it, it, that's stuff that can pop because we're already on there so it's like unlocking a new feature so it's a little easier yeah. to test right so and we have a couple of layers of, of that for what we do we have um features that can help us uh from a um technology and a use standpoint but then we also have features and new new um uh, opportunities from like a um, an advertising standpoint as well too, like a new targeting feature or new inventory opened up and, and everything like that. So yeah. whenever those things roll out, we are very, I would say we're very proficient at, um, at reviewing it, identifying if it's something that we can use right now and deploy it, and then making that determination of, should we try to go after using this right now? Is there anything that's applicable for this? There's also some things too, where we try to be good partners with our, 
our technology providers. Um, so there's some things where we're like, hey, like we want to be guinea pigs, we want to beta test and we get some kind of first look yeah. at it. But also there's some things that roll out that our vendors have already kind of primed us on a little bit as well too. So we know it's coming down the pipeline. Um, but there are things that that get rolled out by technology providers that we look at it and we're like, this is cool, but it doesn't apply to us at all uh, and everything. Right. So, you know, is it worth us to even kind of explore? So there's a, a vetting of even that, but it's a lot faster of a process. And it's usually... It's usually one or two people that are are really kind of being affected by something like that um, and everything. It could be like new electronic invoicing uh, capability or new ad tech or whatever it might be and, and everything. So there's usually one person that can be like, hey, I, I think we should do this for this client because it matches what they're doing. Or, hey, this could help me save 30 minutes on, on what my task is. So I should probably look at doing it. Nice. Okay. Cool. Cool. So, when you guys um, roll on a new software or you know a new uh, uh, you know new feature that sort of thing, what is what is your process like for making sure that you know everybody that's going to be involved you know knows what to do and um, you know is getting the the utilization out of the out of the software that you know you obviously want because you want to get that you know you want to maximize the value of that software. Yeah. Um, so, from a use standpoint. Uh, when stuff gets rolled out to us, uh, you know, anybody that identifies that it could be valuable will then notify the other people that it would affect, um, and everything could be via email, could be scheduling a demo. Um, we mm -hmm. have weekly team calls as well too, uh, uh, for the leadership team to kind of go over, uh, different things where it could pop up there. And then once a month that's replaced by a whole team call as well too. So you have opportunities mm -hmm. to kind of discuss and kind of sh uh, share that with each other. And then once yeah. it becomes something that we adopt, we have a, a manual on how to run the business. We have training videos on on what to do. Uh, a lot of the technology providers that we're, we're selecting tend to work with larger agencies. So they tend to have pretty good customer service where we can call them up and say, hey, how do you how do you kind of continue to, to use this kind of thing? So it's one of those things where um, it depends on what it is, but it could be very fluid and just like, hey, we should try this. But if it's something that is more company wide, then we will do a, a specific training on it and everything. But I find most of these changes tend to happen where it really only affects like, one or two people where it's pretty easy to kind of communicate with them uh, being a, a smaller 15 person company um, yeah. from the vendor side of things of with, with our QGM technology of how to roll that out right now, we're just identifying how to make it better. And it's in this first stage. So it's, it's, it's working, it's doing really good and everything, but um, you know, we want to adopt some of the same things of giving people heads up of really cool rollouts and always improving getting feedback on, what what do our users want that as well too so i always like the technology providers that do that where they they ask they listen to how we're using it and and uh and leveraging it and what uh what's important to us uh, versus just what they think is important and then going down maybe a rabbit hole that isn't as valuable to their users yeah 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 i get that I really, I really like uh, what you were talking about. We were saying, you know, you're you're involving the team, the people that are actually using the software in in that um, in the decision making, in the evaluation, and I'm assuming the decision making process um, as well. How much how much authority do they have uh, in the in that process? Um, more authority than I do, other than the final say. Yes, to be honest, like uh, Ninja Cat, I I've really enjoyed it, but. I'm I'm kind of lucky enough where I'm getting to a point where I don't have to be the one who does everything and researches it. Um, I don't I don't really I never use it um, yeah. and everything. Uh, so besides like being able to see reports and making sure that that I know like hey like this is more client facing. It's like it's client facing dashboard, right? So that yeah. was a long six month process because we had another provider before that that, that we were using and. We wanted to kind of go from the Chevy version of uh, of live reporting for our clients to the Porsche. Uh, and yeah. so we went through that whole process. I didn't spearhead it. Um, I didn't uh, do the demos or the research and, and everything for the most part. I think I did one of them and, and stuff because I trust my team. And they're the ones who are going to be able to figure out and let me know if it's going to be valuable for what they want. And for me, my big thing is, is more of how much does it cost? 
what are we making off of something, you know, something like this? Like, what's the benefit? And what's the value? Does it make sense for us to take this on and everything? So my team has a lot of autonomy of saying what they want. Um, but I also say, hey, along the way, there's going to be milestones where you should check in with me, of, no matter what it is and everything, whether it's researching technology, uh, you know, if it's creative and if it's a plan or something like that. If you get to the point where it's like, hey, I can get kind of a milestone checkpoint of like, is this is where we're heading? Does this make sense and everything? And my team's gotten pretty good at at coming to me whenever they do need those opinions. So they don't go full board all the way to the end. And then they, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? So uh, they've been great. They've allowed me to really ask some of those harder questions and kind of hit it from my angle of what I think is important as well, too. But um, they sure. did all the lead work on that one and they continue to kind of operate in that way, which is which is really nice, which means that if I'm going to have them doing the legwork, then they should have a, a fair say, especially because they're the ones who are going to be using it on a day to day basis. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. I love that. What, what kind of pitfalls um, do you see? You know, perhaps you guys didn't make these pitfalls, but, you know, perhaps you've seen that with, with other companies. What kind of pitfalls do you see uh, happening when people go down that route? go down that rabbit hole or go down that route to, to upgrade their software or, or, you know, find something new altogether. Yeah. I mean the pit, so there's the pitfalls of, of researching something that's not right and then deciding that it's not right and everything. So you waste the time and everything, but that's not as big of a deal as actually saying, Oh, cool. We found this thing. We're going to use it. And it, it doesn't work out. Um, we have hit that. I mean, that's that's why we try to be more cautious not to hit those things and to figure out yeah. how to th think about can we use this long term and can we use this if we evolve into this size of company, uh, which has uh, really helped us out in scaling. Um, so, you know, for for us, it sucks, but that's all part of it. Like it, it's, it's, you know, I, I love the, the quote about um, Thomas Edison. I don't even know if it's true or anything, but um, he was asked, uh, he would fail like 10,000 times to make a light bulb. And when he was asked about, it, he said, I didn't fail 10,000 times to make a light bulb. I found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. So like mm -hmm. that, that kind of mentality, I think it's definitely an entrepreneurial mentality. And I think that some of my teams struggle with that a little bit more uh, and, and stuff, but, also, my team has the luxury if they're using the product that is isn't doing what they need it to do. It stinks that they're going to have to do something different, but at least we're getting a little bit closer, and then maybe hopefully end up with the right thing uh, the next time. But we've definitely done it and um, and experienced it. But it's all part of growing. It's just a growing pain, and it's not that big of a deal, and it shouldn't let you down. It actually should energize you to say, "Hey, we gave it a good shot, and we we really tried and everything." Um, but at least now we're committed to spend this amount of money that that is kind of sunk. Like, let's, let's figure out how, how to reinvest that. Do we need to spend more? Could we spend less? Is there another solution out there kind of thing? So pitfalls are, are awesome. Mistakes are good as long as you learn from them. They're only a problem if you keep doing it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Absolutely. So, you know, with those, with those lessons, um, you know, that, that you've learned from that, I mean, have you incorporated that into your software development? In yes. terms of helping people with the selection process or, you know, providing information or, you know, transparency, whatever, whatever that would look like. Yes. I mean, we're so we're at this like fun, weird launch startup stage and everything to where the hesitation in my voice is is how I answer a lot of questions like this of the answer is yes. Like we have those things and everything. But my hesitation is we are just scratching the surface. Like we're just getting started on what, where I want to take it and everything. So I'm thinking like mm -hmm. three years down the road kind of thing. So it, it, like three years yeah. down the road, I'm gonna be like, we weren't doing nearly what I want to be doing and everything. But you know, right now, like we have, um, we have videos uh, on, on the QGM website for our software. We have um, entire web page, a web page dedicated to every step of the process. Um, I have one more to create and everything. So we're still kind of producing it. Um, we uh, make ourselves accessible to any individual that that signs up right now uh, for it to be able to answer questions. And I'm actually very involved in that as well, too, as well as Patrick. And then the rest of my mm -hmm. team supports on the back end and, and as well uh, from our ad ops team. There's um, there's a there's a, a, a deep desire for the back and forth right now as much as somebody wants. 
we have people on there that we've never spoken with. We have people that, that and 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 I don't think they they might not even have any desire to reach out to us unless there's an issue or something. And hopefully there's not, uh, and and everything. So I love the automated nature of it, and that's where we want to head. And we want to get to a point where um, somebody does not need to talk to anybody and it's as easy as doing Facebook boosted posts uh, and everything. But until we get there, we have to be accessible to them and learn from them and that kind of thing. But even after we get to that point of ease and automation, there's still gonna be questions. There's still gonna be different things. So the QGM side of things, like I, I want to eventually have customer service support and everything. I want us to eventually have people kind of like, uh, LinkedIn does or Indeed or, or some of the job postings where they have a specialist that after a campaign is running for a certain bit, they will mm -hmm. go in, look at it and then hit you up and say, hey, thought that you might want to make this tweak and everything. Just wanted to help you out. If you need anything, let me know. So I'm learning a lot from these other companies where I want to implement them. And then for right now, it's very grassroots. A couple of people on the back end that are just trying to make this accessible to a group of people that never had the access to this technology and being very transparent about that of like, we're, we might have some bumps. We're going to, you know, listen to you. But we we had multiple users give us great ideas already that we're like, we're not waiting until phase two. Let's make those changes now and spend the money on that right now and and everything. Yeah. And and we've done that and it's and it's helped us uh helped us out a lot. And and I'm really excited about the trajectory of where we're going with it. Yeah, it sounds awesome. It sounds awesome. I uh, I love I love projects like what you're doing. You know, it's just like you've got like this baby and you've hatched it and it's just, you know, you're going to watch it grow over years. And you've got like all these ideas in the back of your head and you're just like, oh, I can't wait till it gets to, you know, XYZ phase. So congratulations on that. Um, so yeah. That's, that's, that's and the, awesome. the interesting thing is, is like what, anytime somebody says like baby or like company has a family or something like, like, like that and everything. But like, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because QJAM is, like I would never call it my baby because this is a hundred percent making a resource available for other people. Like, mm -hmm. yes, I want to profit from this. Sure. Yes. I want it to be a big, a big deal and everything and, and stuff, but this is mainly going after a niche and a hole that I feel is, is in the market and then doing it yeah. for other individuals and then just being the engine yeah. that opens it up. So it's not like something that's mine that I want to hold on to that I would that I would die for and and everything like my own children and stuff uh, and right. everything. So um, so it's one of those things where I don't I just always approach it as a little bit of a different kind of personality. And so QJAM is for the users, and that's what my goal is. Ethic is for our clients and our our team members as well too. Like it's always been more about allowing other people to do what they want to do at the highest level. Then it is about me being like, this is my baby. This is my company and everything like that. Because again, my mentality from day one is I want to create things that outlive me that eventually I will not be a part of that can have the chance to kind of go on and everything uh, like that, which I guess could be a child as they get older and everything too. But, you know, you always want to be a part of your, your kid's life, but eventually they, they get to a point where like, nah, I'm good. I'm on my own kind of, kind of thing. And then they come back and eat stuff. Why wow, you sound like you got older kids? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. I got I got a five and a seven year old and everything, but I, I I've I've gotten enough advice from other people that I know that that's coming, and I got a seven year old that acts like a seventeen year old sometimes too. So <laughs> uh, and everything, so little little taste, and I and I know it's coming. I just I just think very long term and everything, which um, yeah. is something where I, I I need to stop and be in the present sometimes because I'm so. I'm always thinking so far into the future and, and stuff. So it's a, it's a pro and a con that I, sure. I struggle with, but I also view it as like a, like one of my, my greatest assets. Sure. For sure. I like that. I like that. So um, last question for you, what do you see, um, you know, next, I don't know, five, 10 years, um, big technology change, you know, with regard to uh, business ops. Oh boy. Um, Besides my, QJM being a global phenomenon. <laughs> uh, national. So geofencing is actually kind of uh, really only works in the U.S. and Canada. So we're going to go with na national phenomena. I don't, I don't need to go global okay. quite yet. Um, okay. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that'd be nice. Uh, so it's going to like five years in tech is is a long time. There are going to be crazy things that come out that are going to be um, fads that that 
fizzle out. There's going to be things that that come on that that revolution. Like Chat GPT is a revolutionary technology. That's just a good example, and it's opening up even more for AI, um, and allowing people to kind of utilize that and get get familiar with it. So there's going to be an advancement in the business sector where these tools and these resources are just going to continue to improve, which means that there's more to learn, but it's not going to, it's going to alter how people do their jobs and, and everything. It may replace some jobs as well too, but probably alter their jobs to be able to utilize it as a tool. Like a hammer is never going to replace a carpenter and, and, and stuff is kind of always my philosophy. But I think that AI is a big part of that. I think advancing technologies is a big part of uh, that as well, too, of be, finding smarter ways to leverage it. But one of the things I also believe in is it's not going to save people time uh, and everything that, if anything, it's going to create people to have um, have spend more time on learning different things and, and what they spend time on. And it's the same thing when the Internet came out and became more prevalent and email and all that kind of stuff, cell phones, it was like, Oh, this is such a, a, a time saver. Now we just do so much more than before. You know, like everybody's busier, it seems like now more than ever. And especially with like a better balance of like um, of, of family and everything. So people are trying to do more with family, do more personal, do more with work and everything. So the busyness is is kind of getting out of hand. And I think that a lot of people will think AI is going to make that better. I don't think that's the case. I think that's it's going to help people do their job and be more efficient and and take some things off of some people's plates, but it's going to add other things to that plate as well too. Interesting, cool, cool, awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much for uh, for being on the show. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, enjoyed our conversation. Enjoyed our other conversation. Um, yeah. Looking forward to talk to you again uh, uh, when we talk a little bit more about uh, advertising in general. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, awesome, Rick. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, folks. Thanks for watching another episode of Epiphany Off the Cuff. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for watching another episode of Epiphany Off the Cuff. Please make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when the next episode is going to drop. Don't forget, we're on podcasts as well, so you can catch us on your favorite podcasting platforms. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Epiphany Off the Cuff.